Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's virtual forum event hosted by the Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Public Policy, known to many Hoyas as Geopolitics. My name is Varsha Menon, and I am a junior in the SFS studying international political economy and minoring in French. Throughout my time at Georgetown, I've had the opportunity to serve on the Student Leadership Council as a co-chair for the Community Committee community committee and as treasurer for College Democrats and Georgetown's ACLU chapter. I am pleased to introduce our guest tonight, Tom Perez, current chairman of the Democratic National Committee. He previously served as the U.S. Secretary of Labor under the Obama administration from 2013 to 2017 and U.S. Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights from 2009 to 2013. During his time as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, he worked to uphold voting rights across the country and investigate police brutality incidents. And as Secretary of Labor, he issued the home care rule requiring minimum wage and overtime compensation for home, workers be, home care workers be paid and the persuader, persuader rule requiring employers attorneys to disclose any communications deterring uniz, unionization. Chairman Perez, thank you so much for being here to share your perspective with us tonight. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Georgetown College Democrats and the Georgetown Bipartisan Coalition. I'll now hand it over to our moderator for this evening, Geopolitics Executive Director Mo Alethi. Marcia, thank you so much for that introduction and for your leadership on campus. I also want to thank um, the, our co -par our partners in this event, the Georgetown College Democrats and the Bipartisan Coalition for helping us pull it all together. Um, and most importantly, I want to thank all of you who are tuning in uh, on Zoom, uh, as well as across all of our social media channels uh, for this timely conversation. Uh, the first in our two-part series, a chat with the chairs, uh, where we're going to talk about campaign 2020 uh, and particularly in the context of um, the the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this event's going to be recorded, it's going to be posted, you'll be able to watch it later uh, and unlike a lot of other events we actually want you to keep out your phones throughout the course of the event and share your thoughts on social media by using the hashtag GUVirtualForum and tagging at GU politics across all of our channels. So here's how this is gonna work. In a couple of minutes, I'm gonna shut up and we're gonna bring in the chairman and we're gonna, he and I are gonna have a conversation uh, in the beginning for about the first half of the event. Uh, and then we're gonna open it up to those of you from the Georgetown community who are participating via Zoom. Uh, those of you who are, look at the bottom of your screen. You will see the Q and A option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Click on that and type in your question. Please indicate whether you're a student, your staff, or faculty at Georgetown. And then uh, for those whose questions are selected, a member of our team will send you a private message letting you know that we'll be looping you in. So please keep an eye on your chat if you've submitted your question and be ready to be uh, on video to ask the question if you're selected. So make sure you're, you're camera ready um, and feel free to start populating the um, and with that, I think we're ready to begin the conversation. So uh, allow me to welcome Tom Perez, Chair of the Democratic National Committee. And in the interest of full disclosure, I do want people to know that my last job in politics before I retired from, uh, from partisan politics uh, to come to Georgetown was as spokesman for the DNC before, before your time, uh, Tom. But um, we're happy to have you and happy to have you back. Uh, engaging with us here at GU Politics. It's great to be back with you and with everybody watching and I hope everyone is safe and sound. Um, all right, uh, so I think the last time we talked uh, uh, at Georgetown, uh, you were fairly new in the job. Um, Donald Trump had just been elected, you had just been elected chair of the DNC and you were telling us what you were doing to get ready for campaign 2020. We're here now. And we now have, uh, the Democratic Party now has a presumptive nominee. So now that there's clarity, you've made it through the primary season, a wild one. Now that there's clarity, tell us what the state of the race is. Tell us mm -hmm. what's the argument that Democrats are going to be making heading into the fall. 
Well, uh, I'm proud to be here with a uh, presumptive nominee. Uh, we started out with roughly two dozen candidates for President Mo, uh, the largest field uh, in our history. And we made a commitment at the DNC to make sure that everybody got a fair shake so that the voters could decide. We made some really important reforms to our rules involving, for instance, uh, super voters be the ones deciding at the grassroots level. And we went from 24 down to, uh, again, a presumptive front runner. And what I said uh, in 2017 and what I've said since is that uh, our goal is to make sure that everyone got a fair shake because we want to make sure that we come out of our Democratic primary united. And, and what I am proud of is every single candidate uh, has issued a full-throated endorsement of the vice president. I'm really excited about that. And, and what we're doing now is we're leading with our values. Um, this election is about healthcare. Yes, it's absolutely about climate change. It's absolutely about women's reproductive health. It's about uh, making sure an economy works for everyone and not just a few at the top. It's really about democracy as we know it though, as well. Uh, it, it's about a president who's chronically incompetent. It's about a president who is uh, chronically divisive, uh, a, a president who puts himself in front of the national interest. And, and we're going to be talking uh, from now to Election Day. We have our virtual clipboards out because we can't knock on doors, and we'll get to that shortly. But what we're going to be talking about more relentlessly is um, we need experience in the White House. We need a person with a steady hand at the tiller. We need a person who is competent who can handle these absolutely existential crises of our moment, who can restore dignity and respect to the Oval, Oval Office, who can command our respect uh, globally and, and lead not only domestically but internationally, uh, and, and frankly can restore common decency uh, to the White House. We need all of these and then some. And, and uh, if we weren't in the middle of a global pandemic right now, what we would be talking about, uh, Mo, is – um, the lights out turnout that we've seen, not just starting in um, early in the primary season, but what we saw 2017, 2018, 2019, Democrats turning out at scale, electing Democrats up and down the ticket, governors, um, state house races, uh, state legislatures, the United States Congress. Uh, Democrats are motivated to win. Uh, we're as united as we have been, and we are building the infrastructure at the DNC so that we can win up and down the ballot across the country. So I know you're the kind of guy that likes to look forward, not backwards, and I want most of this conversation to be forward looking, but I do wanna reflect for a moment on the primaries. Um, and you have both good and bad that you can point to from your perspective, I presume. Record turnout, um, unity amongst all the, the candidates uh, at the end of the process, but you also had some hiccups. And I'm wondering, most famously uh, looking at what happened in Iowa, what the DNC moving forward is, what lessons it's taking away from that um, and how to strengthen the primary process moving forward. Right. Well, one of the things we did, Mo, uh, going into this primary process is we engaged in a series of really important review, uh, um, revisions and reforms. I mentioned the reform regarding superdelegates. What I didn't mention, which is directly relevant to your question, is we made a lot of reforms on primaries and caucuses. Our goal was to increase the number of primaries and reduce the number of caucuses. Why? Because more people turn out in primaries, and we want more people to participate. And the we in this sentence when we made these reforms was a very eclectic group of folks. Um, Senator Sanders and his team had seats at the table. They were incre incredibly constructive in this process. Representatives from the Clinton campaign and others had a seat at the table. And we had 14 states in 2016 that held caucuses. We had seven in 2020 that held caucuses. And uh, Washington State saw their turnout go up, I think, eight or ninefold uh, in their primary that they had this year for the first time. We had seven states that were still caucus states, one of which was Iowa. And the lesson I take away from Iowa uh, is that, quite frankly, you know, um, parties should be in the business of winning elections, not running elections. Uh, I have sued a lot of states when I headed up the Civil Rights Division, Mo, because people who do this for a living make a lot of mistakes. Some are 
mistakes of um, they just did something wrong. Some are, frankly, nefariously motivated mistakes. And they're not even mistakes. They're misdeeds. And um, we should really make sure that uh, I think we need to really talk about how to get out of the business of being in primaries. Because Iowa was an un was you know, unmistakably um, a debacle, and uh, we fell short. And the we in that sense is everybody uh, who was involved in that. And, and that was a low moment. But I'll tell you where we are now. Uh, we have come together. We're, we're going to learn from Iowa. By the way, after we win this election, we will reflect on the entire cycle. And two conversations we will have, Mo, are how do we further reduce the number of caucuses? And how do we have a conversation about the order of the primaries and caucuses? Those are two conversations that will begin after we win the elections. Those are two conversations that need to happen. And what happened in Iowa certainly illustrates that. Um, we'll look forward to seeing how those conversations turn out. Um, all right, so where we are now, um, I think everyone would, would, would recognize that there was a remarkable coalescing of um, all the candidates um, after the primary season came to an end uh, just last week with Senator Sanders and Senator Warren uh, throwing their endorsements and joining all the other former candidates throwing their endorsement behind Vice President Biden. But there does seem to be at least a little bit of residual um, uh, hesitance among some Sanders supporters um, about jumping on board with the vice president, some of uh, Senator Sanders' former staffers um, uh, have said that they're reluctant at this point. What's your message to them? How do you win them over and convince them that this is where they ought to be? We're going to work hard to earn your vote. Uh, we understand that we're not entitled to your vote. We have to earn your vote. And uh, we've spent a lot of time at the DNC uh, working toward that end. The vice president is acutely aware that he has to earn every vote. Uh, we will continue to work very closely. I'll give you an example. I mean, I've, I've been in contact regularly with Jeff Weaver, uh, who I consider a friend. Jeff is uh, one of Senator Sanders' right-hand people, senior campaign advisor, very involved in both the 16 and the 2020 campaign. And I've had many conversations uh, with Jeff, and, and we're going to be sitting down in the very near future because we want to learn from the Sanders campaign about uh, things that they did, and, and they did so many things really well. And we, all the Democrats coming together, uh, want to learn from them. Uh, you see the Vice President and Senator Sanders and their teams are talking about how do we come together on really important issues, college affordability, health care. Uh, Vice President Biden has been talking with uh, Senator Warren as well about really important issues, bankruptcy reform being among them. And so we're going to continue to come together. Our platform process provides further opportunity uh, to have those discussions. I was really excited to see uh, the vice president earn the endorsement of the League of Conservation Voters, uh, I think, just today. Uh, that's a really critical set of constituencies in the environmental uh, movement. Uh, he has been earning the support of folks from the labor movement. We're going to work everywhere, and we understand uh, that we have to earn your vote. I'm excited that when you look at the polling, um, the overwhelming majority of people who voted when we had seven, eight people in the race said, uh, I'm gonna vote for whoever the nominee is. Far higher levels than we saw Mo um, in 2016. But at the same time, again, we take nothing for granted and we look forward to sitting down and listening in the months ahead, earning your support because Donald Trump is an unmitigated disaster for our democracy. And we must have everyone together. And our unity is undeniably our greatest strength and his worst nightmare. Tom, um, uh, before I ask my next question, just a reminder to those that are uh, participating via the Zoom link um, that uh, the question and answer tab at the bottom is active. And you can feel free to start populating your questions now, uh, which we will turn to about uh, starting about halfway through the program. Um, all right, I wanna talk a little bit about where we are now and how your job has changed unexpectedly as a result of, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I mean, look, it's hard to beat an incumbent president of the United States. The last time it happened was nearly 30 years ago. Um, and that's under 
sort of the, the best possible set of circumstances for an opposition party. You never had to do it. No one's ever had to try it in this unique set of circumstances where you and your entire teams are socially isolated, where all of your organizers are socially isolated, where uh, all of the voters that you're trying to talk to are socially isolated. So I'm curious how the DNC has adapted and adjusted its program to campaign in this situation. Sure. We have changed our tactics. We haven't changed our goals. Our goals are to uh, win elections up and down the ballot everywhere, and we're going to continue to do that. Over the last month, Mo, we've trained 7,000 digital organizers uh, from across the country, 49 states, uh, States participated. Uh, we had 101, 201. We, we're in the middle of a train the trainer uh, series. I think six weeks long. All of these are virtual. We our battleground buildup began last year in the key battleground states, and so we have had people on the ground. We're actively hiring, and and yes, we are now. We're not door knocking now for obvious reasons, but. Uh, because we made so many investments beginning in 2017 and 2018 and 2019, we've built relationships that are critical. And we're working with, um, with, with voters, and, and uh, we, we can do a lot of online voter registration for those who aren't yet uh, registered to vote. And let me give you a very concrete example of how we can overcome obstacles. Um, Wisconsin, the secretary there was um, April the 7th. And uh, I can't say enough good things about the party chair uh, in Wisconsin, a guy named Ben Wickler. Uh, we've had a great partnership with Ben. And in the run up to that election, and, and for your viewers, you should also know that not only did we have the presidential primary, we also had a state Supreme Court race. And Republicans engaged in one of the most unconscionable things I've seen. And I've done a lot of voting rights work over the years, voter ID and other purges, things of that nature. I've never seen Republicans use public safety uh, in the way they have done in Wisconsin. And so uh, we filed a lawsuit with the party in order to expand that. Governor called a special session to postpone because they're in DEFCON 1 right now in Wisconsin, and it's disproportionately affecting African Americans in Milwaukee. And so we tried hard to get Republicans to postpone it, but they saw an opportunity to suppress the vote and win an election in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, for this critically important state Supreme Court race. Well, here's the punchline. They failed miserably, notwithstanding help they got from a Republican-controlled state Supreme Court and the uh, United States Supreme Court. They failed miserably on election day. And that's because under the leadership of, of Chairman Wickler, and we were proud to be partners in this effort, we reached out like never before uh, to voters and got them to vote absentee. Almost a, roughly a million people voted absentee in Wisconsin, where four years ago it was something like 100,000 people voting absentee. And so we organized, we were, we were um, texting people, we were calling people, we were um, you know, using every social media channel possible to contact them. And because we had built relationships dating back to 2017, 18, and 19, we not only won, we kicked butt. The, the, those Supreme Court elections are usually won by 6,000, 10,000 uh, votes. We won this race. The candidate the, Demo the candidate the Democrats supported won by 150,000 votes. So we can do this. We showed in Wisconsin. We know how to organize. We know how to organize in the middle of a pandemic. They tried to suppress the vote. We um, were able to stop that. And most importantly, voters are motivated. They want to get rid of this president. And that is what happened in Wisconsin. And I'm proud of the voters there. I'm proud of the party there. And it's a great example of what we're doing across the country. So I want to look at just a couple of different aspects of the typical, because I really want our students to understand sort of how parties have to innovate and adapt in a situation like this. So we've talked a little bit about how you've had to adapt your organizing model and move it maybe from the traditional boots on the ground to fingers on the keyboards. Um, what about fundraising? Uh, how does this pandemic, how does this crisis of impact, you got to raise a lot of money in order to run a national 
a national campaign. Well, we've been raising money online for a long time, and our grassroots supporters have been incredibly generous. And by the way, so have our candidates. So after they got out of the race, all the candidates have been really supportive in sending um, emails to our list of millions of donors. Senator Sanders sent emails, uh, Senator Harris, uh, Mayor Pete, uh, Cory Booker, et cetera. All the candidates have been doing that, and, and that's helped us raise millions of dollars for the DNC. Uh, I do a number of Zoom fundraisers uh, where we bring people together. And, and one advantage of a Zoom fundraiser is that uh, we're not limited to a, a geographic location. We can have events that we that bring in a number of people. We've had surrogates who um, participated in these fundraisers. And so we continue to move forward. And, and I've been so humble uh, because these are dire economic times. And I, I, I frankly, I always feel... Um, you know, uh, uh, reluctant uh, to be asking for money. But at the same time, one thing I will say to everyone watching with certainty, we are going to have a presidential election in less than 200 days. That's going to happen. So we must move forward. And again, uh, my, my dad always, um, you always count on the un unexpected in life. And, and this pandemic was unexpected, but um, we're prepared for it, at raising money, uh, raising consciousness, uh, raising friends. I, I did a, a Latinos for Biden event last Friday. I uh, had hundreds of people from across the country. I uh, did it together with the Latino Victory Fund and uh, folks on the Biden team. We're doing more events like that. And, uh, you know, we're very fluent uh, at the digital uh, sign of engagement. We, we invested $22 million already in uh, YouTube ads for September October for the run-up to the election, because we know that's where people consume their news, and we're going to be uh, a major spender there persuading voters. Um, the other major role of a national party uh, in a presidential cycle is actually nominating your candidate. You've already had to, um, as of the, already had to delay um, the date of the national convention. I'm wondering if you can walk us through sort of the thought process of you've got all these states that need to still select their delegates to the national convention, many of whom cannot physically gather in order to do so. So how the DNC is working with states to get that part of the business done. And then what's your thinking about the convention now scheduled for, for late August and how you're planning for different contingencies? Right. So we moved the uh, convention back roughly five weeks from the 14th of July to the 17th of August. And we did so for obvious reasons. Uh, we want to make sure we, we, we've bought five weeks and we think those five weeks can be critical because right now uh, Wisconsin is in the throes of the pandemic. And, and I'm hopeful that by August we'll be in a better position to have uh, a, an in-person convention in Milwaukee. We will never put our public health head in the sand. We will continue uh, to consult with uh, the authorities. And I'm confident that we can have a very um, a muscular, exciting, uh, Wisconsin-y uh, convention highlighting our values. Uh, we're always in contact. And we have a great team, um, very, very adaptable, very, very uh, experienced. And we have great partners in Milwaukee and the mayor of uh, Milwaukee, Tom Barrett, and, and Governor Evers, uh, uh, Congresswoman Gwen Moore, uh, who has been a great partner, uh, uh, Senator Baldwin, uh, so many partners there. And, and I, I really look forward to it. And, and again, we're going to put on a safe convention. We're going to put on an exciting convention. And everybody on the ground there has been uh, exceedingly flexible. And, um, and as it relates, and, and one of the advantage, Mo, related to your question is when you buy the extra five weeks, it gives those states who had to delay their primaries the time to get their ducks in a row. Uh, we have a very um, experienced set of folks on the DNC who helped develop these rules. And uh, we're working very closely and carefully uh, with the state parties so that we can um, make sure they carry on their elections in a safe manner. And then we get all of our delegates that we need for the convention so that we can have an exciting convention, uh, the nomination of the vice president. Obviously having uh, a presumptive nominee this early uh, Mo, makes this conversation a lot uh, more doable uh, because uh, we're, we're, we're all together as a party. 
And uh, it's, it, I mean, you look at history, coming together in early April, early to mid-April uh, is, I won't call it unprecedented, but it is remarkable uh, when you have 20, almost two dozen people in the race. And, and it's just, it, it, it inspires me, the, the character of every single candidate. Uh, we're going to be able uh, to do so much because uh, we have so many people working for the vice president and working with the vice president. And we have a man of character who is just made for this moment. Uh, and I'm confident uh, we'll have a great convention and um, a successful election in November. I mean, you know, we're supposed to take a group of students to each party convention, both to Milwaukee and to Charlotte for the RNC. And I guess I'm just trying to figure out if we should be booking our, our plane tickets yet. <laughs> but, but part of my question is, you know, you got to plan for different contingencies, right? And if the governors of these states, um, you know, Wisconsin in your case or North Carolina in the case of the Republicans, still believe that there needs to be some sort of uh, social isolation in place, even if it's not total as it is now, even if it's partial um, or, you know, just limiting the size of gatherings, how much time do you, I mean, these are not easy things to put together. When do you kind of really have to make a decision about for it? Well, again, we've had, uh, as I said before, we're not going to put our public health heads in the sand, uh, unlike the other side. Uh, I understand that uh, we have, we want to carry on a robust in-person uh, convention and we need to make sure we carry on a safe convention. So we're always planning and hoping for the best but we're planning for every contingency. And, and that, that's what preparedness is about. Unfortunately, this president hasn't gotten the memo on preparedness uh, and we're, we're paying dire consequences. Uh, we have a really experienced team and we will be prepared for whatever contingency exists. Uh, we will nominate our standard bearer. And, um, and in the meantime, we are organizing everywhere so that everybody understands that uh, uh, Vice President Biden uh, will lead us out of this pandemic. Vice President Biden will lead us out of this economic uh, cliff that we've fallen into. And he will uh, lead the battle for the soul and, and frankly, the character of this nation. Again, I'm confident we'll do that. And, and the, and the uh, convention, however it turns out, will be a, an important part of it. Um, we're going to turn to student questions in a minute. Um, and so, again, a reminder to students to submit questions at the Q&A tab at the bottom of the, of the screen. But before we move over to them, um, I wanna to touch on something you've already kind of brought up, at least in passing. One of the big um, uh, points of contention between you and your counterparts at the RNC in recent weeks has been over the issue of voting, just v voting during this crisis. And that really sort of came to a head in Wisconsin where there was a big showdown over whether or not was people of Wisconsin ought to be voting on primary day in person. Um, and both parties really leaning into messaging around the issue of vote by mail, leaning into messaging both sides making the argument that their position is the one that truly protects, uh, maintains the integrity of our election system. So I'd love to get your thoughts on how do we hold safe elections that protect the integrity of our elections in this environment? Well, I think we hold safe elections that ensure the integrity by providing as many different options as possible to voters. What do I mean by that? Um, we should always uh, work to provide uh, a, a day of election option to vote. For many people, voting on election day is a cultural experience. We should also provide early voting opportunities. And early voting is not only convenient, now we know in the world of social distancing, um, it's also uh, consistent with public health imperatives. You look at Arizona, they had a primary on March 17th, 80% of the people voted early by mail. So by the time you got to the primary election, they didn't have that many people voting, so they had they could uh, do voting consistent with um, with social distancing principles. So you want to have early voting. You want to have no excuse absentee. You want to have different forms of vote by mail. And the studies are legion that vote by mail 
is um, something that this notion of it's fraudulent, that's just horse hooky. Uh, and by the way, well, one, to, to slightly correct your question, you know, the governors of Ohio and New Hampshire and Iowa, Republican governors, have said, uh, we've got to expand vote by mail. Florida, you know, Republican governor, they have vote by mail. Um, here's, here's the real crux of this conversation, though. And this is really the fundamental difference. Democrats believe that every single eligible person ought to be able to vote, and we should do our level best to make it as easy as possible for them to vote. Republicans don't want everyone to vote. And don't take my word for it. Um, I, I, there's a 40-second video I, wanna, I would appreciate if you would play for folks here. It embodies the Republican theory of... Uh, what they want to do in elections. And this is a guy named Paul Weyrich, a founder of the conser modern conservative movement. Uh, this is a candid acknowledgement of what Republican voter philosophy is about. Now, many of our Christians have what I call the goo-goo syndrome, good government. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. That's 40 seconds, folks. That's the founder of the modern, one of the founders of the modern conservative movement. His last sentence is what really uh, gets me. Our, our, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting population goes down. I think the two most interesting words in that sentence are quite candidly. We want less people to vote to be candid. We heard from Donald Trump a couple, uh, a few days ago, oh, vote by mail, you can't do it. By the way, he did it, Pence does it, most of the cabinet does it, um, but we can't do it because it, it's bad for Republicans. Why are they so scared of having more people vote? And, and that's the fundamental critique I have. This is undemocratic. This is un-American to make it harder for people to vote. And I've lived this world of voter ID laws. I've lived this world of voter purges. And now we saw in Wisconsin the most unconscionable form of voter suppression on steroids, making people choose between their safety and their right to vote. That's not right. And I'm proud of what we are fighting for as Democrats. And I admire the courage of a few Republican governors who acknowledge that vote by mail should be part of that choice that voters have. I wish others would join them. So Tom, I wanna um, follow up with sort of arguments or red flags put up actually on either side of the ideological spectrum. So uh, our friends at the RNC would say that if you move to an all vote by mail system, particularly in short order, where in places where they don't necessarily have a history of it and try to set one up in time for this election, that you're opening it up to the potential for um, not just errors and mistake, but voter fraud. And they point to this issue of ballot harvesting, where bad actors can go and uh, bring, uh, sort of help people fill out their ballots, collect those ballots, change their ballots, and, and bring them in en masse, and that this is a tool that bad actors can, can do to change um, the election. What's your argument to the ballot harvesting, but also the uh, the issue of, of voter fraud? Sure. Well, I mean, there's study after study after study showing voter fraud in uh, in, in in the vote by mail context is just BS. I mean that that is absolutely. Look at study after study. Talk to the folks in Oregon, Washington State. Talk to the academicians who study that. That's just a non-issue. The other thing I want to point out is. We're not talking about exclusively vote by mail. We're talking about preparedness. As I said in response to your question, I want to reserve the right for in-person voting, and we have filed lawsuits to that effect. I want to preserve and expand the right to early vote. I want to make sure there's no excuse absentee voting. I want to make sure there's uh, pure vote by mail. All of the above are how we expand these. The ballot harvesting issue is another bogus issue. And by the way, it's ballot, they, they took the term ballot collection and gave this nefarious term ballot harvesting. Let me tell you why ballot collection is really important. 
If any of you have ever been to the Navajo Nation in Arizona, it is a huge expanse of, of land. It's, it's one of the sacred lands in America. Talk to people who live on the nation, people who are all too frequently living in poverty. They live six or seven miles from their P.O. box. They don't get mail delivered to their homes uh, because of the uh, rural nature of their, their existence. And so the uh, issue of ballot collection for Native American communities, whether it's in Arizona or Montana, has been a critical issue of access to the ballot because if they have to find a way to get their ballot that they have filled out into the election site, which is often 20 miles away, and they don't have uh, transportation access. If you don't do this, you deny them the right to vote. We sued in 2016 on this precise issue. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, and I quote, what Arizona did in pre preventing ballot collection was, it was done for the express purpose of discriminating against Native Americans. That's what the Ninth Circuit said. Now, there has been one case of voter fraud in this context. And by the way, it was by Republicans because Democrats aren't filling out their ballots for them. They just take the completed ballot and put it in. There's been one case and it was Republicans in North Carolina in one of the recent congressional elections. One case. You know, if one airplane crashes, we don't ban airplanes across America. We figure out what happened to that one airplane. If one car crashes, we don't ban automotive travel in America. This uh, ballot collection uh, imperative for not only Native American voters, but for elderly residents uh, in nursing homes and elsewhere is a critical way that they vote. So I don't believe in throwing out babies with bathwater, and I don't believe in discrimination. And so I welcome this conversation, and I, I hope somebody asks uh, – uh, Chairwoman uh, Romney uh, McDaniel, you know, what does she think of what Paul Weyrich was saying? Because it's pretty unsubtle. And what Donald Trump has said about voting is pretty unsubtle. We can't have vote by mail because we might lose. Why, why don't, don't be so scared of the voters, you know, let them make the choice. And my last follow up before we go to the students is on the other end of the spectrum, right? Amongst uh, Democratic Party allies. Um, just today, the NAACP and the Center for American Progress put out a report urging um, that there be, as you say, as you're urging, multitude of options, but warning that by moving entirely to vote by mail, as some states are, are suggesting, with both Democratic and Republican governors, that, um, that by moving entirely to vote by mail, uh, it could inadvertently disenfranchise African Americans, disabled, and Native American people that live on reservations, rely on same-day voter registration. Um, and in an academic report put out by the University of Florida and Dartmouth, they found that younger voters, voters needing assistance, out-of-state military voters uh, in vote-by-mail scenarios had their ballots rejected at higher rates. So I know you're saying have multiple options. But my question is, if we're still in this pandemic come election day, uh, November of 2020, and the medical professionals are still pushing social distancing and avoiding, uh, urging us to avoid large gatherings, how do you protect against these types of inadvertent consequences, unintended consequences? How do you protect against these issues for people who are worried about voting by mail, but are also worried about going in person? Uh, by having a number of best practices in place. Number one, make sure that the requirement is that it be postmarked by election day, not received by election day. Uh, some states that have vote by mail provisions, Florida, for instance, require it to be received by election day. And there are studies that show that young people and communities of color tend to turn their ballots in later. And, and frankly, I think the Florida legislature knew that. And so it disproportionately impacts them. So that's one thing you can do. And, and states like California, if, you, if it's postmarked by election day, same thing with Washington State, same thing with Oregon. They have been able to mitigate these issues by having that. Number two, 
Another way that results in ballots being rejected is through these so-called signature match requirements. The problem with signature match requirements is that all too frequently the people checking the signatures aren't properly trained. And so they are rejecting signatures improperly. And when you deal with that, and there are ways uh, to deal with that effectively, Mo, that would, uh, I think, address these issues. One, one other, I, I talked about the ballot, uh, you know, allowing people uh, to bring ballots uh, in, in bulk. You know, I, I mentioned the you know, Native American and seniors. That's another way to make sure that folks don't have these problems. Every state, you know, we don't have a federal, we don't have a federalized election system. Every state does things differently. But I don't think you should have to win the geographic lottery to be able to exercise your right to vote safe and sound. And I applaud what people in Washington State and Oregon and elsewhere are doing. I, I, I applaud what uh, my good friend Alex Padilla is administering in the great state of California. They've, they have more people voting in California than ever before. And, and they're very attuned to the concerns that you raised. And I think in Washington State and Oregon, they've been able to address any of those concerns. And, and, but again, what the other side's trying to do is make it harder. If you go to Texas, your concealed carry permit is a permissible form of ID to vote. But your University of Texas student ID or your Prairie View A&M student ID is not a permissible form of ID. Um, that is so obvious why they are doing that. You have to travel 120 miles in some places in Texas to get the requisite ID. I call that a poll tax. And, uh, and so it, the, the differences are really quite clear. And, and Democrats in, in the stimulus bill are gonna continue to work to make sure we have those options because I, I, I believe that's the best way to go. But I always, um, I, I think we, we can't overstate the differences between you know, this president and, and Democrats on, on this sacred issue. This is gonna be a linchpin, make no mistake. Voter suppression on steroids is gonna be a linchpin in the Republican strategy in, 20, uh, in November of this year. And I'm confident you'll hear Chairwoman Romney McDaniel talk about all the voter fraud that's going on with uh, vote by mail. That's just, that's just fictitious. Okay, we got about uh, 15, 20 minutes left. And so we're now gonna get to the uh, student questions, which are always better than mine. Um, and we'll kick it off. Um, when, when we call on you, uh, ask us, tell us who you are, where you're Zooming from, what year and what you're studying at Georgetown, and then try to ask your uh, question as succinctly as possible so we can get as many in as possible. All right, first one, I apologize if I mispronounce, uh, Vitarith Chan. Hi. Um so my name is Vidra Chan. I am a first year student, a first year graduate student uh, doing uh, data science and analytics uh, uh, at Georgetown. And I'm calling from my uh, bedroom. Uh, for my question is, uh, so the Bloomberg campaign uh, was known for having a really great digital analytic infrastructure. So uh, has the DNC and the Biden campaign uh, been in touch with them? Or is there any legal issues if you guys get together and, 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 and do something in terms of their, uh, the infrastructure that they have? Yeah, uh, yeah, Mayor Bloomberg said, and he, he said, I'm in it to win it. And if I don't win it, I'm going to continue to help uh, in meaningful ways. And he has done exactly that. Uh, data infrastructure is really critical. I'm, I'm very proud of the infrastructure we've built at the DNC. Uh, we have... We have six to 7,000 campaigns that are going to use our voter file and our data and technology infrastructure. Uh, our cybersecurity infrastructure, we were helping all the presidential campaigns and we help uh, down ballot races. And uh, again, our, our ability to communicate with Wisconsin voters, to use a recent example, because we had made those investments in data and technology and have uh, the ability to do uh, so many things that, frankly, we didn't have the ability to do before uh, is going to be indispensable to our success. I, I, if asked the question, what, what, am I, what are the things I'm most proud of in my tenure at the DNC, uh, we have just dramatically modernized our data and tech uh, and cybersecurity infrastructure so that we have a much more granular understanding of the voter. Uh, and when you have a much more granular understanding of the voter, 
you can connect better with the voter. And, and we'll continue as uh, the law permits to have conversations with not just Mayor Bloomberg, uh, but with others in the data technology ecosystem uh, who have been helpful. And, and that's uh, the, the proliferation of people in the progressive data and tech space has really uh, enabled us uh, to uh, implement tools, incorporate tools, and, and, and really, uh, I think, win elections at scale because of uh, that technical advantage that we've been able to gain. No? Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, Emma Burke. Hey. Hi, Emma. Hi. Hi, so my name is Emma. I'm a senior in the college studying psychology and sociology. I'm I'm here with my dad and my sister watching this event. We're awesome. excited to, to be able I to like watch your fridge. <laughs> yes, there's our fridge. We just had dinner. Um, so I just wanted to ask more of a logistical question about, um, given the coronavirus, what the general election um, debates will look like um, and if they will be happening. The um, Commission on Presidential Debates is a um, nonpartisan commission separate and apart from the DNC. We, we control the debates during the Democratic primary process. They uh, control it during the general election uh, process. And so that's a decision that will be up to them to make. Uh, the last debate we held, which was held on March the 15th, it was originally scheduled for uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And with the situation on the ground uh, deteriorating, uh, we decided out of an abundance of caution to do the uh, debate in Washington, D.C., our, our debate partner, our media partner in that was uh, CNN. And so we did the last debate uh, without a studio audience uh, at CNN headquarters in Washington. And so um, I'm hopeful that by this fall we'll be in a better position uh, to again uh, have those debates. And by the way, debates without an audience is not unprecedented. Uh, those of you may want to go on television and watch an interesting debate between uh, John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Uh, so uh, it was a spirited and interesting debate, and it's studied in many schools like your school uh, for decades uh, following that debate. And I'm confident the same thing will happen there. And, and that was a really, um, it, was a, it was a very good debate. It was very substantive. And so there are ways to do it. Um, I'm sure that safety will continue to be job one. All right. Thanks for the question, Emma. Next, we've got Jacob Bernard. Uh, hi, Mr. Chairman. My name's Jacob. I'm a freshman in the SFS and I'm from South Jersey. Uh, my question is about rural America. So in order to win um, in the upcoming election in states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, North Carolina, we need to appeal uh, to rural America. So what are our plans for rural America and how do you plan to communicate those plans to rural America? Well, we've, uh, that's a great question, uh, Jacob. And one of the first things we did uh, was to establish uh, and, and really make um, much more muscular our, our rural council. Uh, we've got some great people in that. And in order to win elections, uh, you got to organize in every zip code. Uh, and let's go back to Wisconsin, just to give you an example of our success. Uh, our candidate for the, the, the candidate the Democrats supported for state Supreme Court uh, won that race. In the last two Supreme Court races, last year and the year before, I think one was decided by six or 7,000 votes. One was decided by 12,000 votes. In this particular race, the candidate won by 150,000 votes. If you took out Milwaukee and Madison, uh, she still would have won by 30 or 30,000 votes, something like that. How did that happen? Well, in Wisconsin, uh, she, she, just, she did really well in Brown County, which is Green Bay, if you're a football fan, the home of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, she did really well in uh, Racine County, in Kenosha, in the, the northeast corner of Wisconsin is uh, Marinette County, held her own there. In order to win, and, and Tony Evers is the governor of Wisconsin, not simply because he performed well in Milwaukee and Madison, but because he performed well throughout the state. We lost elections because we ignored all too frequently rural parts of states, but we haven't done that anymore. 
And that is why you look at Michigan in 2018, you look at Pennsylvania in 2018, you look at Wisconsin. I bring those three states up by way of example because we lost all those three states in 16 and we swept all the statewide races in those three states in 2018. And we did so because we had a really aggressive rural engagement strategy. And guess what? People in rural America have pre-existing conditions. People in rural America want broadband. People in rural America understand climate change. People in rural America are getting hammered by the tariffs, the senseless tariffs. 10% of dairy farms in Wisconsin last year went under. And the straw that broke the camel's back was the tariffs. Uh, so many rural uh, areas of this country in red states that haven't expanded Medicaid are in huge trouble with coronavirus because their rural hospitals had to shut down because they didn't expand Medicaid. And if you see a hotspot emerge in those areas, they're in huge, huge trouble because they lost their health care. They lost the anchor of their health care infrastructure. So I'm proud to organize in rural America because our values, I firmly believe, can command the respect of, uh, of the majority of voters in rural America. And that's, that's, again, how we won at scale in 2018 and how we're going to win again in 2020. Thanks for the question, Jacob. All right, Rachel Engel, you're up. Hi there. Um, my name is Rachel Engel, and I'm a senior in the college. So my question is, um, in his dropout announcement, Senator Sanders said that he would continue to gather, de gather delegates to gain leverage over the creation of the 2020 platform. Um, so for somebody that's not super familiar with that process, can you give us a little glimpse into how the party platform is created and how the different parties within the Democrats within the Democrats will be able to make their voices heard during that process? Sure. Uh one of the signature things that we do in a convention is ratify our platform. And our platform is the value statement, as you know, of our, of our party. It really expresses the values of our party. And, and both Vice President uh, Biden and Senator Sanders have been working uh, together on a number of issues relating to the platform, as have uh, Senator Warren and others. And I think what you're going to see in, um, in August is a platform that truly embodies our values in a really uh, robust way, it, you will see the fingerprints of all of the candidates because they all had some really important ideas that deserve to be heard. And so what we do in the coming months is uh, we are going to be and, and have been doing engagement with various stakeholders uh, that, that reflect the broad array of issues. And, and on the issue of delegate allocation, what, one thing that will be certain is uh, the vice president is working hard to make sure that uh, people who supported Senator Sanders will have a meaningful seat at the table. Uh, again, when we made the rules of engagement for the 2020 cycle back in 2017 and 2018, the Sanders team was at the table, and they were at the table in meaningful ways. There were a number of um, folks from his uh, senior team that helped us uh, create the rules. And, it, and because we had such an inclusive process, I think we had uh, a really good stretch moving forward, and, and I really appreciate their role. And so um, it, it, Mo asked me a question before about how do you bring people together? You bring people together by making sure that everybody feels that their voices are heard in a meaningful way. And that's exactly what the Vice President, Senator Sanders, and, and everyone, I, if, if you supported another candidate, uh, you know, I assure you that uh, their voices are going to be heard as well. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, our next question, this is pretty cool, comes from a future Hoya, uh, Eamon right. Walsh, who is uh, admitted to uh, Georgetown uh, beginning in the fall of 2020. So welcome to the conversation. Welcome to Georgetown, Hoya Saxon. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Prez, I'm from Oregon, and I'm working on a state Senate campaign there right now. And okay. we were going to run a grassroots campaign and knock on doors, and that was our plan to win. But with the pandemic, that obviously can't happen. So what do you think is the best strategy to win? Is it phone banking? Is it social media advertising? What would you do in this case? I definitely have my uh, digital clipboards out. I mean, I, I would be engaging with people. Um, I, I have a high school senior who's heading to college. I mean, Instagram's a big part of this world. Uh, other social media platforms. 
you, I would strongly urge you to uh, have as many, uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time getting people's cell phone numbers. We've actually purchased 130 million cell phone numbers and we give them to the state parties so that they can engage voters. We, we purchase a lot of, um, we get a lot of, um, you know, hashtags and, and other social media handles so that we can engage with voters. Uh, there are, I would want to know a little bit more about the contours of your district and, and then figure out uh, what seem to be the social media platforms of greatest preference in your district, and then you probably want to get on there. And there's no substitute for good old-fashioned uh, organizing. I was on the phone, and, and I understand you can't knock on doors, but uh, you know, I, I did a virtual event with Pennsylvania people the other day, and uh, you know, we had 120 people on the phone, on the Zoom. And I said, you know, all of you, if you all take responsibility uh, to get 20 of the people you know from your your circles out to the polls in November, and then you ask half of those to do the same thing, look at the force multiplier potential. So what I would do is figure out who your staff are and figure out who the core supporters are, and then. Uh, get those core supporters to find other core supporters and, and using their uh, contacts folder uh, to connect with folks. And uh, you know, make sure you have a really good website that's interactive. You can produce really good video content uh, from you know, your, your room and, um, and, and really uh, differentiate uh, moving forward. So, uh, you know, again, we've changed our tactics at the DNC, but we haven't changed our goals. And I think it's made us – uh, a lot more nimble. Uh, I'd rather not have a pandemic. Please, like, don't get me wrong. This is this is a disaster on so many levels. Uh, but we are. It, it, it we're, we're. It is what it is, and we are doing our level best, and I think doing it effectively to continue to engage. And Wisconsin was one such example. Um, thanks, Eamon, and again, welcome to Georgetown. Um, all right, Tom, we're running out of time, so I have one last very brief question for you. And I am going to ask uh, Chairwoman McDaniel the exact same last question. So for the RNC oppo researchers that are listening in <laughs> with this last question. Look, this is that time of year when college students are, are naturally anxious, right? What's my summer internship going to be? Or I'm about to graduate and I want my first job to be on a campaign. And my office hours are usually flooded with people who, who are trying to get advice on how to get onto a campaign. Um, that anxiety is, is heightened right now where they're just, they don't know how to get involved in this environment. So what advice would you give to young people who want to get involved in a political campaign or the party, uh, this summer or upon graduation who are worried that the pandemic is going to prevent them from being able to do so? Right. Well, the, the first piece of advice I would give you is, uh, uh, don't lose heart. Uh, don't lose hope. Uh, there are, we are still uh, employing people. We're still getting so many different people out there now. And uh, remember, I, I used to coach baseball and I used to play baseball. In, in baseball, if you bat one for 30, you're not going to be in the lineup very long because that's not a good batting average. But if you bat one for 30 in your job search, uh, that's, that's a Hall of Fame set of stats. And so work on that denominator. Uh, don't hesitate to make contact. Um, I, I've worked in academia. Uh, and, you know, one thing, I, I always feel um, a moral and ethical obligation. And I'm, I'm pretty confident I, I, I speak for uh, Chairwoman Romney McDaniel. You know, we've had a lot of folks who've um, helped us out in our journey forward. And um, it's, a, it, it's a virtuous cycle. And so I always feel uh, a moral and ethical obligation to help others. I met somebody last Friday whom I've never met before in my life. She's a master's in public health uh, graduate student, and, uh, and she had a job that fell through. And um, last night I put her in touch with a friend of mine who's in her field of study. Um, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, and, and I did it with uh, pleasure because I have a long memory of folks who gave me that first opportunity. And I'll tell you, um, there's never been a more important time for you to get engaged because, um, you know, the, the young, I, I have three kids, 23, 
21, 17. Um, they are the reason I ran for this job uh, because I want their future to be full of opportunity. Uh, I want you to continue to get engaged. And I hope that you will, don't worry also about it. It has to be a presidential or bust. There are so many elections across the country. And what I would tell you is if, if you know someone running for a state rep, uh, they may be running in the seat that's going to flip that uh, chamber or help flip that chamber. So don't worry about um, what particular seat it is. Frankly, for that race, you're probably going to have a lot more responsibility. And so I, I served in local government. I served in state government. I ran for local government. I, I ran statewide. I've, I've been in the feds. Um, and I've loved every chapter of it. So don't hesitate to talk to people that you don't know. You're going to find that people are pretty generous uh, with uh, their wisdom and with their contacts folder. Um, make sure you expand that denominator, as I said. And, and you are in the perfect time of your life to do this right now. I mean, uh, people are going to look back, and you're, someday your children and grandchildren are going to study this era. This is a moral fork in the road for us as a nation. They're going to study this era, and they're going to ask you, what did you do to help restore our democracy? And you want to have a good answer for that. So get out there. Uh, Mo is very generous with his time. You've got a great, great reservoir of talent at Georgetown University. Uh, don't hesitate to call them up. If you know people elsewhere or that's a friend of a friend, uh, get a virtual introduction. Don't be shy. Uh, get out there and do it. Uh, because I'll tell you, uh, you don't get rich in this line of work, but the non-monetary rewards are indeed priceless. I'm pressed. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time tonight and your, and your thoughts and your advice to our students. Um, this is, we said, it's the second time talking to us here at the Institute. We're looking forward to the next time being in person again, uh, and who knows, hopefully, uh, hopefully at the convention when we bring students out um, to the to the convention in Milwaukee. Uh, I want to thank all the students uh, who participated tonight and all those who viewed across all of our platforms. Uh, as we referenced, we're going to continue this uh, series on Wednesday with Republican National Committee Chair Rana McDaniel. Um, so keep an eye out for the information on that conversation. Uh, tomorrow, our virtual forum continues where uh, we'll be having a conversation with Fox News Sunday anchor Chris Wallace talking about covering the coronavirus and the role of journalism uh, in, a, in a national and global crisis. Next Tuesday, we'll be hosting um, the RNC chair's uncle, Senator Mitt Romney, for a conversation on American leadership during a time of global crisis. And then we're gonna take a break, uh, probably. We might squeeze one or, one or two more events in before finals, um, but we'll be back after finals with hopefully a full summer slate of programming. Just follow us at GU Politics for more information. So again, Tom Perez, thank you, Georgetown students, to the G GU College Democrats and Bipartisan Coalition for partnering with us. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you.